Well, as uh, Misty indicated, we're continuing our sermon series on the book of Acts. Uh, We've been looking at sort of major ideas and themes and events that have happened throughout the book of Acts. And today we're looking at verses 36 through 41 of chapter 15 here in Acts. Hear these words from Scripture. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Come, let us return and visit the believers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark, but Paul decided not to take with them one who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not accompanied them in the work. The disagreement became so sharp that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and set out, the believers commending him to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. May God grant us wisdom and courage as we hear these words from Scripture. Thanks be to God. Well, as we've been looking at the book of Acts, uh, we've been studying also various spiritual practices that the early church employed. Uh, It helped it to grow. We've looked at worship and prayer, challenging ourselves to pray five times a day and worship once a week. We've looked at giving challenging ourselves to engage in five acts of special intentional giving each month. We've looked at serving and by doing an intentional act of kindness each and every day. We saw in the stories of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch and Peter and the Roman Cornelius and learned that we can engage in daily examinations spending time each day to look at your day and examine how you have been listening to the Spirit of God. And today, we are going to look at the spiritual practice of study. Now, this isn't going to come from a specific story from Acts, but it comes from our collective study of Acts in these sermons. Study is what we do as Christians to gain wisdom and knowledge It is an act of educating ourselves. The purpose of study is, of course, to acquire knowledge. Uh, We study in order to learn facts. When we were in school, we studied so that we could do well on quizzes. And we study the scriptures because we want to learn what happened or who did what. We can also study by examining outside the actual scriptures themselves. What's the context of the scriptures? What was the social context, for instance, of Paul's letter to the Romans? Or what was the context of the book of Leviticus? But transformative study is more than just learning facts. It involves using our imagination and critical thinking. This critical thinking element comes in as very important when we look at the book of Acts. Now, I've said several times that Acts is a history, so to speak, of the early church and the struggles they went through to try to put into actions the instructions Jesus had given the disciples during his ministry. Acts is a record written by Luke of the persecution that the church faced, the challenges they faced surrounding who's allowed into this new sect called Christianity and who isn't. It's a story of influential characters like Peter and John and Philip and Barnabas and Paul. And there are some very influential women in this story as well, and we'll be getting to them soon. They say that history is written by the victors, and that's true in Acts as well. But today we have the story of Paul and Barnabas, 
Now we've had several stories uh, with them already. Barnabas was a man that many of the apostles considered as a strong person of faith. The apostles sent Barnabas to share the good news with other people outside of Israel. And so Barnabas chose Paul to go with them. And together they made quite a team. They were sort of the John Lennon and Paul McCartney of their day. So impressive, in fact, that in some of the cities they went to, the people there thought that they were Greek gods and tried to worship them and offer sacrifices to them. Paul and Barnabas came back to Jerusalem from their first journey and successfully argued that the Gentiles did not need to be circumcised in order to become Christians. Barnabas and Paul were a team, and a very, very good team at that. But before they can even take one step on this second journey, the team breaks up. It seems inconceivable. They were such a good team. Paul was a born speaker. He was eloquent. He was persuasive. Barnabas, as we've said in an earlier sermon, was the encourager. In fact, his name means son of encouragement. So what happened? How come Paul and Barnabas do a Lennon and McCartney and break up the act? Well, just like many people think it was a third person who split up the Beatles, Yoko Ono in fact, there was a third person who split up Paul and Barnabas. Remember that during that first journey they took together, Paul and Barnabas had someone with them for part of that trip, and it was Barnabas' cousin, John Mark. Now, I asked you then to remember that name because we would come across him again. And here he is. Paul and Barnabas are planning their second journey, mapping it out. Barnabas wants to bring John Mark with them. But Paul remembers how John Mark had deserted them during that first journey. He had just quit and went back to Jerusalem. And Paul is still mad about that. And he tells Barnabas that there is no way he is letting John Mark come with them. Luke, in telling this story, says that the disagreement between them became so sharp that they parted company. Now, it's easy to read right past that. They have a disagreement. But remember that Luke is the master of the understatement, and it, it really was a sharp disagreement. It was a fight that led them to turn their backs on each other. Here is Barnabas, who wants to give John Mark a second chance. He was the encourager after all. But Paul doesn't want to deal with this traitor. Later on in his ministry, Paul would write those famous words that we find in the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Love is gentle, love is kind, love keeps no record of wrongs. But he sure doesn't seem to be wiping the slate clean with John Mark now. Paul and Barnabas could not see eye to eye. So Barnabas and John Mark, they take off for Cyprus once again. They'd been there together on that first journey. And Paul heads out to Syria and he takes Silas with them this time. Now this all happens at the end of the 15th chapter of Acts. There are 28 chapters in Acts and Barnabas never shows up again. The remainder of Acts focuses on Paul, his journeys, his arrests, his imprisonments. We first met Barnabas back in chapter 11, but in just four short chapters, he went from being a leader in the early church, being the one who found Paul and called him to accompany him in his journeys, to someone who is completely overshadowed by Paul and disappears from the story. History is written by the victors. Luke, who wrote Acts, 
begins to appear a little bit in the story himself in chapter 16 as he begins to travel with Paul and the others. Luke is the chronicler and Paul becomes prominent. Now Paul does do some very important things. He establishes churches all over the Mediterranean. He writes instructional letters to the churches and to various individuals. But he was not the only one who did that. But he's the one that we focus on because of Luke. We need to remember that the church was growing and changing. The leaders of the church were also growing and changing. They weren't perfect, and that includes Paul. In chapter 15, just right before the story we have now, Paul had argued that no one needs to be circumcised in order to be a Christian. But in chapter 16, just a few short verses later, Paul meets Timothy, a young man whose mother was a Jewish believer in Jesus and whose father was a Greek. But let me read you just one verse from chapter 16. It's verse 3. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. And he took him and had him circumcised because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Now that's after chapter 15, and it seems pretty hypocritical. But it was perhaps, I think, more about expediency than necessity. Timothy didn't need to be circumcised in order to be a Christian. But if his Christian witness was going to be of value to a Jewish audience, Paul thought he would be a better witness as a circumcised believer. Now it's interesting that Luke doesn't give us the conversation that Paul and Timothy must have had on this subject. It just says that it happened. And I would bet that in Luke's style of storytelling, they had no small discussion about this. We've already seen that Paul has no tolerance for John Mark, at least in this early phase of his ministry. Later on, Paul does write about love having great tolerance for all. The fact that Paul could grow in his understanding and knowledge should give us comfort. We too are growing and changing. What we believe now may change as we get more information. What we believed when we were younger may not be what we believe now. Many churches see Paul as the source of Christian theology that is infallible and timeless. But I want to suggest that Paul changes his stance on things several times in scriptures. And if you ever find that you tend to disagree with Paul on a certain issue as you read through Acts or his letters, well, you're in pretty good company. After all, Barnabas disagreed with Paul. As we approach any part of Scripture, we need to engage our critical thinking. For me, that means trying to Read the passage with imagination, maybe placing myself within the story. How would I react to what was going on? Putting myself in their shoes or, or sandals, so to speak, in those stories. What was Barnabas thinking? What was Paul thinking? And even though John Mark is only mentioned, I could wonder what was going on with him. If we grant that these were real people who had their own outlooks on life, who experienced emotions, who were able to disagree, to get mad, to fall in love, to have doubts and worries, then we can more easily find some place for us as we actually engage the story. So study means, of course, trying to get the facts straight. And since the book of Acts is set up as a history, we can approach it as we try to figure out where 
Paul went on his second journey, for instance, or learn about the source of the conflicts in the early church, such as inclusion. <clears throat> so study for facts, but study with imagination engages us at a much deeper level. And that is what I call transformative study. I value Paul a lot. He was a groundbreaker as far as equity goes, opening up opportunities for women in ministry multiple times, writing to the churches in Galatia that there is no longer male or female, slave or free, Jew or Gentile. Some of the most moving passages in the New Testament come from the pen of Paul. But there are several things attributed to him that I have trouble with. His contradictory instructions for slaves to obey their masters, for one. Wives, submit to your husbands, for another. From one person, such wisdom, and yet at the same time, such misguidance. Now we know that Jesus studied the Hebrew scriptures that he had grown up with, but he engaged in transformative study. He used his imagination as evidenced by his use of parables to teach truths. He engaged in critical thinking as when he told the crowds, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye, but I tell you, turn the other cheek. You have heard it said, but I say unto you. There is nothing wrong with having your own disagreements with Paul. He was monumental in the life of the church for sure, but he wasn't perfect. And he was changing and growing in his understanding. And we also need to change and grow in our own understandings. Otherwise, why study? Why read scriptures? If it's only to reinforce our already fixed beliefs, we cannot grow. We cannot adapt to a changing world. Christianity starts to become irrelevant. Our spiritual practice challenge for today is to engage at least once a week in transformative study with Scripture. Approach the Scriptures transformatively with imagination and to approach it critically. I mean, that opens up the doors for us to walk into a world of wonder. Not just an ancient world, but it also helps us to see our own world today with eyes of wonder. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, I thank you for the examples we have in Scripture of those who, who wrestled with what it meant to be a disciple of yours who wrestled with scripture. And we can use their example to give us permission to also wrestle with scripture. Thank you for giving us minds that can think creatively, minds that can engage with imagination, minds that can try to puzzle out what it is you're trying to say to us today. Help us to use those faculties. Help us to engage in transformative study. For we ask this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.